Curative is another question. Uh, I've always maintained that perhaps there is no such thing as cure because the cause is the industrial capitalist matrix that we live in. And until we do away with that, um, there will be no cure because the cause is embedded into the very toxicity of our social existence. Love and having a support system, uh, looking forward to life, uh, being creative, um, you know, uh, the vibrancy of uh, relationships. Those are critical, in not only in one's quality of life, but the will to live and to define a new life. Welcome to Health Action. I'm Bob Lederer. Today I'm honored to be speaking again with an amazing warrior for justice and liberation who has been battling colon cancer for more than four years. I'm talking about Fred Ho, the radical Chinese-American baritone saxophonist, composer, band leader, writer, producer, and self-described matriarchal socialist activist. His works appear regularly at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, the Guggenheim Museum, and the Apollo Theater, among others. He's received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, the New York Foundation for the Arts, and the Rockefeller Foundation, among numerous awards. Here on Health Action, we've been following Fred's inspiring, self-empowered journey through cancer in periodic interviews since 2007. For the first few years, Fred combined Western and so-called alternative and nutritional treatments. For quite a while, he appeared to be on a path to recovery, but then he suffered many setbacks. Today, once again, I want listeners to get an update on Fred's journey, as well as to hear in more depth than before Fred's radical insights on how he needs to fight the disease and how the society as a whole needs to fundamentally change its structures that promote cancer. This will be the first of a two-part series. Part two will air a week from today. Fred, thank you so much for coming in today to speak with our listeners. I'm very happy to be speaking with you again, Bob. So, uh, to briefly review... Fred, you were diagnosed with stage 3B colon cancer in August 2006. Since that time, you've kept an engaging and thought-provoking cancer war diary, periodically emailed to friends, which brilliantly documents your journey and your growing insights. After considerable research, you decide on an integrative therapy program that included, on the one hand, chemotherapy, and on the other hand, special diets, supplements, herbal teas, exercise, and removing yourself from the treadmill of a career. And a key part of that mix was a support network that you inspired among your friends. Now, over this period, the cancer initially went into remission, then returned four times with the longest remission lasting almost a year and a half uh, up until the summer of 2010. So can you just briefly walk us through the twists and turns of your many treatments and setbacks and advances over the last four plus years? For the sake of simplicity, let's say I've had four tumors in four years, though technically speaking, they were two primaries that had recurrences. So four tumors, but two of those tumors were repeats of previous ones. Um, essentially, I went through everything in the um, protocols and treatments of Western allopathic industrialized medicine. I've had seven surgeries, including a temporary ileostomy bag and with that reversed. I went through three sessions of chemotherapy, all the chemotherapy drugs made for colorectal cancer, all six of them. There are seven on the market, but the seventh one is a repeat of one of the others. Um, that included the first line treatment of Folfox, which was three chemotherapy drugs, fluorouracil, oxaliplatin, and leucovorin, and then the other three, renotecan, zolota, and cetexamab. Um, I also had radiation treatment as well uh, that lasted for three months. Um, the first tumor that appeared in my colon uh, seems to have been vanquished after uh, it recurred again and all these treatments uh, were done. The third tumor, or the second new tumor, um, 
was in my rectum, uh, on the corner of my anus and my rectum. And that was diagnosed in December of 2008. And uh, that uh, was uh, taken out by surgery through a transanal excision. No chemotherapy or radiation by that time because the side effects of those treatments had um, created severe uh, risk for me. Um, I had developed hydrodephrosis of my left kidney, essentially my left kidney not working anymore or weren't only working in minimal capacity, about 9% capacity. Um, I had suffered uh, tremendous peripheral neuropathy, that's numbness and lo loss of dexterity and pain in my extremities, my fingers and my feet, and a whole host of other problems. Um, so no one on the Western medical establishment side felt that chemo chemotherapy or radiation could be done because if I lost my left kidney, I mean, if I've already lost my left kidney and I lo lose my right kidney, then I'd have to be going to dialysis, and that was uh, too much of a price to pay. Um, so that has been the Western uh, portfolio of my treatments. But I decided after the fourth tumor, the recurrence of the second primary, that um, I was not going to pursue any more of these uh, cut-burn-poison strategies of Western medicine and began to search for what was then called alternative treatments, but which I prefer to call naturopathic ones. And that has been the summary of my um, battle with uh, the cancer, my war with cancer. Uh, a major shift that's happened from four years of being the, the perfect cancer patient following dutifully the Western protocols and the Western path, and then my coming to a conclusion that I wasn't going to follow that anymore because um, they had no solutions. Uh, and to develop a self-healing approach that was going to be naturopathic. So um, when you embarked on that naturopathic path um, last fall, um, the, the centerpiece of that, I mean, you, you, you retained some of the other elements that you had been using all along as far as herbs and exercise and supplements, but you added a new radical element, which was a, a raw foods diet um, that also um, excluded any sugar-producing elements <clears throat> such as fruits and certain vegetables such as carrots, beets, and corn. Um, so tell us a little about how you arrived at that approach and, um, and uh, more detail about what that diet consists of, and you're still on that today. In the fall of uh, 2010, after I was presented with the possibility from Memorial Sloan Kettering that I would have to have another surgery, eighth surgery, to remove my rectum and completely and live with a permanent colostomy bag, and yet the surgeon could not in any way give me any curative chances, I decided that I could not uh, go with that proposal, at least for this moment. And uh, I began to inquire about alternative treatments, of which I found out about people using an a raw, extreme food diet to basically starve cancer. The only thing that the naturopathic and the allopathic people agree upon is that cancer is anaerobic. It feeds on the lack of oxygen and basically um, requires sugar. So um, everything we eat, of course, produces glucose, sugar. Um, but I wanted to try to do an experiment and see if I could eliminate all sugar intake and see what that would do. And um, my conclusion is that, uh, that the raw extreme diet creates profound personal philosophical uh, benefits, but it may not be enough to actually defeat cancer, particularly in its advanced stages, though I did confirm there were people who um, uh, were able to beat stage four cancer, uh, cancer that's been metastasized, but it was still a short time out, three months out, possibly a year, um, you know, but uh, I've not been able to confirm anybody who's been able to beat cancer primarily or strictly through a raw food diet for more than a year, um, you know, and... Uh, uh, for me, I uh, began a, an extreme raw food diet, which, uh, as you described, I eliminated all sugars from fruits, uh, high sugar producing vegetables, and it did things, it did, did wonderful things for me, including dramatic weight loss, losing one pound a day. I lost 55 pounds in basically uh, almost three months, and uh, it had tremendous benefits for me, but it did not necessarily cure me of cancer. To clarify a couple points, 
um, this tremendous weight loss was from a place where you felt like you needed to lose weight, right? Because obviously in, in cancer, there's a common scenario where people uh, lose weight below what would be healthy for them. So can you clarify that? And also tell us about um, a, a question that people often ask about raw food diets, which is what is your source of protein, which is obviously vital for fighting cancer? My in primary intention was to beat cancer, not to lose weight. But weight loss was a consequence of this dramatic change. And it improved a lot of things that the allopathic people thought could never be fixed or could only be managed pharmaceutically. For example, hypertension. During all of this period of time, uh, I had dangerously high blood pressure, 170 over 120. Within two weeks, my blood pressure was fixed. Without medication, I was prescribed um, amlodipine or Norvasc. And that only brought my blood pressure down a few points. But within two and a half weeks, by this extreme raw food diet, losing one pound a day, my blood pressure, hypertension problem, was fixed. My blood pressure now is about 110 over 68, even better than perfect. Um, I weighed about 225, 230 pounds at about five feet, nine and a half inches tall. By uh, two and a half, three months, I weigh now about 170. And I would have continued with further weight loss, but I had to alter all my clothes and change, you know, uh, everything. And uh, I decided I didn't want to really lose any more weight. So I'm staying right now at about 170. Uh, not completely extreme raw food now. It's about 50-50, but primarily vegan is my diet. And a source of proteins? I don't subscribe to the protein dogma. I mean, we need to look at the um, T. Colin Campbell uh, book, the China study, the biggest study ever done on the connection between diet, nutrition, and disease um, done in the People's Republic of China, a U.S.-China co-sponsored study uh, that spanned about a decade in which basically the Chinese diet in the rural areas, which relied upon protein from vegetable sources as opposed to animal, considerably less of uh, animal source based protein than the United States diet, those people uh, had dramatically better health and a lot less incidence and rates of disease across the board from cancer to heart disease to diabetes and so forth. Um, and my view is that there is a protein dogma right now that feels like all of our food has to be hardcore protein. And the assumption is that hardcore protein has to be made up of animal sources. My protein source is primarily from nuts. Protein is, there's protein in, um, um, you know, soy as well as uh, beans and legumes and many green leafy vegetables. And we actually do not need as much protein as we think we might need, uh, particularly as promoted by the protein dogma uh, in the affluent societies. I, b I believe that all of our protein sources can be gotten from vegetable, plant-based sources. And as part of my own raw extreme diet, I did take in some animal sources, primarily raw seafood. Now, uh, in your cancer diary of March 18th of this year, you wrote that um, in, in reference to the course of your diaries over the last four years, that you've had some good days and mostly bad days. But since beginning my alternative naturopathic treatments, that has been reversed now mostly good days and some bad days. I've recounted how profoundly my life has changed, and for the first time in the four-year cancer war, I truly have confidence and hope I will be able to beat cancer. However, recently, more bad days have been occurring, but only on days for which I was not getting my alternative treatments. So, Fred, tell us about this kind of up-and-down roller coaster, which obviously is, um, is extremely anxiety-producing and and scary. Um, how has that been for you? Have you been able to uh, kind of find ways to intervene in that? And, and how do you feel about where you're at at the moment? The conundrum is uh, our alternative treatments or naturopathic treatments, palliative, meaning relieving of symptoms, or curative, meaning solutions. I don't have a final answer on that. I think that the palliative benefits feeling better, for instance, are important. I've come to realize that dignity, quality of life, and taking charge of one's own uh, treatments and course uh, 
you know, in fighting uh, cancer are uh, uncompromising values one needs to have. Um, curative is another question. Uh, I've always maintained that perhaps there is no such thing as cure because the cause is the industrial capitalist matrix that we live in. And until we do away with that, um, there will be no cure because the cause is embedded into the very toxicity of our social existence. Um, but for me, the uh, vacillation or oscillation between good and bad days happens because when I have my treatments, those are the good days. When I'm away from my treatments, those are usually the bad days. Um, and it's connected to the fact that uh, part of my treatment is, involves intense amount of oxygenation, primarily ozone therapy. This is a highly controversial area. It's illegal in 37 states in the United States of America. Um, but I'm a big believer. Even if it's simply uh, palliative, it's still worth it because it grants you the dignity of life because it is naturopathic. And by naturopathic, my definition of that is not just that it comes from nature because to get pure oxygen that doesn't exist in nature, it has to be created, manufactured technologically. But naturopathic means three important principles. One, it's efficient, meaning that it actually works either palliative, palliatively or curatively. Two, no side effects. Three, costs almost nothing. This is the revolutionary paradigm that challenges Western capitalist industrial medicine. Three things. One, it works better than the cut, burn, heavy pharmaceutical prescriptions of Western capitalist medicine. Two, there are no side effects, no losses to you. Three, that it costs almost nothing. Well, Fred, you were just alluding to one of uh, what you've described as the, the four basic elements of the cancer therapy program that you've put together, and that's oxygenation, um, referring specifically to the ozone, and I know you have other modalities for oxygenation. Um, the other three elements are hydration, nutrition, and love. Um, so uh, why don't you just briefly walk us through what those other three elements consist of and what the theoretical basis for them is. Hydration is that 70% uh, of our body as well as 70% of the planet is water-based. Chemotherapy and radiation tr treatments create severe dehydration, so we need to stay completely hydrated. Um, nutrition, we need to optimize our own personal health and our own immune system. So having the strongest nutritional components, high-density nutritional food, primarily organic or with um, uh, Masanobu Fukuoka refers to as natural farming, uh, in other words, non -an or anti-industrialized farming practices for food sources is the best. So maximizing, optimizing our um, nutritional intake, our uh, nutritional density of the food that we uh, consume is very, very important. And love. Uh, if we're not happy and if we're not looking forward to life, uh, if our spirit is not strong, um, this is the one thing that uh, some people in the allopathic side uh, will, will co-sign, and that is having a strong spirit, uh, a will to live, uh, you know, may, may be the demarcating line between those who survive and those who don't. And um, love and having a support system, uh, looking forward to life, uh, being creative, um, you know, uh, the vibrancy of, of relationships, those are critical in not only in one's quality of life, but the will to live and to define a new life. Most people assume that cancer is a curse. You know, we may just simply be collateral damage in um, the, mac the exponentially increasing um, environmental social toxicity wrought by capitalism, but we don't have to be passive victims or um, you know, passive patients, that uh, we should understand that, um, uh, you know, we can create a new paradigm, new social relations, new sense of selfhood uh, that um, doesn't accept uh, this order and these prescriptions. And I'm speaking with Fred Ho about his journey through cancer over the last four years. 
Fred, you've combi- compiled the entries of your cancer war diaries into a book entitled Diary of a Radical Cancer Warrior Fighting Cancer and Capitalism at the Cellular Level. And um, you wrote uh, a little description of, of uh, what the book is about and said, my intention is to make this an instruction manual and philosophical tract for fighting the twin interconnected interrelated plagues of cancer and capitalism. I know that you've just finished the afterword. You've sent it to the publisher. It's going to be released in September. So just tell us what you think people will get out of reading it. I'm going to be very simple, direct, and blunt. And probably those people in the mainstream medical establishment will hate me for this or uh, denounce me. But it's this simple. This is the matrix. Capitalism is teratogenic meaning that capitalism is the cancer for the entire planet Earth. Cancer is the accumulation and interaction of social environmental toxicities produced by capitalism for the person. Capitalism and cancer are inextricable as accelerative malignant processes. Cancer is not a disease. That's the mistaken idea. Cancer is a process in which the affluent, more affluent the society, the more the cancers, the type of cancers, and the higher the cancer rates. Amongst so-called primitive peoples and societies, the lower the cancer rates and other diseases. But they're not completely immune because we now live in a globalized system. Uh, a system of environmental social toxicities that permeate the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the land that we walk on and from which the food we grow, uh, from which the food we grow. So that is the matrix. That is the matrix. That is the matrix that is the cause for cancer and which needs to be eliminated, destroyed, undone. What will replace that is the burning question. That's why I describe myself as an aspiring Luddite. Industrial society needs to be ended. All the little toys and all the little plasticities that we've come to accept, like plastic, didn't exist 60, 70, 100 years ago. We don't need them, and they're toxic. And Fred is also writing a second book with Peter Liu, tentatively titled Raw Extreme Manifesto, Losing Weight, Self-Improvement, and Changing the World by Spending Almost Nothing. And both of these books are going to be published by Skyhorse Publishing, um, the, the cancer book in uh, September of this year, and the Raw Extreme Manifesto in January of 2012. Uh, folks can get more information um, in the near future on the website skyhorsepublishing.com. That's all one word, skyhorsepublishing.com. And Fred, as we close, um, you and your Afro-Asian ensemble are having another performance coming up on Friday, April 22nd at the Breck Forum. Tell us very briefly what uh, folks can, uh, can expect when they go to that performance. Since getting the news of tumor number four, I decided that uh, I would be on a tear uh, to cement my legacy, to forgo the surgery and the permanent colostomy bag installation so that I would have maximum amount of time and energy to um, make sure if I pass from this existence that my um, contribution to revolutionary politics and art would be um, solidified. So this event, April 22nd, is my first public performance in New York City since that diagnosis uh, in the fall of 2010, and it's to celebrate the release of three projects. Deadly She-Wolf Assassin at Armageddon, Mama Song, a manga CD project, um, Big Red, the new CD of my Afro-Asian music ensemble, um, and Year of the Tiger featuring Fred Ho and the Green Monster Big Band. Okay, and that's Friday, April 22nd at 7 p.m. at the Breck Forum, which is at 451 West Street or the West Side Highway between Bank and Bethune Streets in Manhattan. For more information, you can go to brechtforum.org, that's B-R-E-C-H-T, forum.org, or call 212-242-4201. That's 242-4201. And folks can read uh, some of Fred's cancer diary entries 
or contact him through his website, which is www.bigredmediainc.com. Again, bigredmediainc.com. And I want to very much thank my guest, Fred Ho, for sharing these thoughts and, uh, and this very rich experience and, and brilliant, innovative path that you've taken. And I want to wish you absolutely the best of luck. Um, I want to invite all the listeners to stay tuned to this program a week from tonight for part two of this interview with Fred Ho. And you can get an audio archive of uh, this segment as well as links and other information um, and the script for the show at our website, which is www.wbaihealthaction.org. Again, wbaihealthaction.org. I'm Bob Lederer. I want to thank John Riley for engineering this segment. And until next time, stay healthy and stay balanced. And we go out with the Free Mumia Suite on the CD Big Red by Fred Ho and the Afro-Asian Music Ensemble.